Good morning. So this is uh, going to be a twofold video. We're going to discuss. Uh, I'm going to discuss my GM reflections on Simborum's game last night. Uh, at some point, my dog may bark in the backyard. Um, it's his. It's his. It's his mo in the morning before my wife and he go on a hike. He'll run around the yard raising hell. So if you hear him, bear with it for a few minutes until he's in the car and gone. Okay. So I'm going to talk. Really, I'm going to reflect a little bit about this. Uh, there's not a lot for me to reflect on. I've, I've run this five times, but it was, you know, two years ago, locally. Uh, and I knew then that I appreciated the, the actual system, the mechanics, uh, the, 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 the setting and the world, uh, character design are, for me, without question, I think they are, they are a great dark fantasy choice. Um, so there's really not much for me to add to my conversation about Symborum in that sense. I already know those things. Those things are true. I wasn't going to learn last night that I didn't like the world, and I didn't like the setting, and I didn't like the characters they created, and I didn't like the role under mechanic. Those things weren't going to happen, right? I already have played this five times, I ran it five times, and I understand those things. Uh, I was rusty, of course, because I haven't run it in two years. Um, but the goal was an icebreaker. I purposely wrote a a thing so they would encounter the rules. I wanted to make sure we set their characters in the world, that we involved their characters uh, directly with why they were in Blackmore getting ready to do the thing they were going to do, and then I wanted to use expedition rules, uh, excavation rules, which are part of another uh, set of rules for the Symborum library or canon, and I wanted them to experience the combat, etc, etc. So it, it was not how I traditionally run a game. You know, I'll prepare things I'll sometimes have a scene-by-scene -scene thing ready to go, but very often I run things with a lot more uh, agency, right? Giving the players a lot more choice, depending on whether our characters are already set in the world and in a way in which we can create natural conflict. Okay, so the second part of this session, ultimately, or uh, the second part of this video, I will talk about predestination gaming versus free will gaming, because that's ultimately the difference between player agency and railroading, right? That is... Those are the facts, right? You either believe in the predestination of the session and what the players will see and have and experience and a goal and a thing, or we don't know where it's going to go, right? And that's where open world sandbox hex crawling generally occurs, right? Uh, we don't know what's in the hex. The GM's going to roll the dice and we're going to define a forest and we're going to define that they run into an old ruin and that ruin happens to be on page 462 and it's defined and then they're going to decide to go into the ruin and then we're going to follow the ruin uh, that's predefined on page 462 or we're going to roll random tables that just constantly tell us what, what's in this room. What's in. That's, that's random play. And we, it's a literally emergent, uh, right, as, as the GM doesn't know. And so when, people, when I talk about Naive Narrator, I know there are people that are screaming, dude, I do that with constant random tables in my solo gaming. That's right. That's right. Okay. So it's, you know, free will, player free will, character motivations, uh, a character exists. And because of that, there should be some relationships that are natural conflicts in the world. So some more last night I did. I prepared, uh, I, I don't know, I think it's six scenes 12 total. Well, let me grab it. I think I still have it up here. I didn't put it away. But normally, this is all. So, any hand notes I have, I, I will uh, uh, transcribe into prep, uh, into GM notes for the next sessions if I continue to run games. But then, this ultimately is dated, folded up, and it will be it'll be put in a file, right? It'll be stapled, folded, dated with all the players, and then I have forever records of that session, right? And then I have a box in the storage just loaded with these, these things. But so I had written it. It's literally written uh, a written module that I that I've made available to them. They can have. They can use it themselves. Uh, it also they can read through it and kind of see where I diverted or where things diverted from, from the module, right? But then I wrote prompt cards because I I wanted to just prompt myself that okay uh, we don't you know we're starting the game with an interlude. Welcome to Blackmore. So this was in front of me. I knew that okay right. I just didn't want to lose track of my module. So I, in a way I have an outline of my module right here. So I could just flip. Once we did the, once we went, I introduced them through an interlude to Blackmore, I throw that card out like, a, like you know, a speech. Then the next one is, oh right, meeting Rigel. There's going to be a scene where they meet Rigel. Now I read the interlude description, physically read it, and I, I read the description of Rigel. Didn't read anything else for the remainder of the session. 
all I needed to do was make sure I got the uh, challenge and the difficulties right that were written in the module, right? If they encountered the snake, what is the snake's challenges, etc. And what page number the snake was on, because I didn't, I'm not going to write stat blocks in my module, I'm just going to go to the book and use the snake from the book. So, you know, that just reminded me, hey, now we're going to go into a scene where they meet Rigel. This is where they're going to maybe persuade him or negotiate with him. Or who knows what might come out of that. But it's a scene, meaning there will be conflict. There will be dice checks, potentially. Not always, but could be. Right? And once we finished that, I threw that out and I said, okay, now we've got to get to Davokar. Well, I described that in a short interlude that she she basically marches them out of Blackmore across the plains, the excuse me, the firebreak plains to the edge of Davokar. Right? And then I have a scene. Davokar beckons. They had to make, as they stepped into Davokar, and I described the forest, and I described what they were hearing and feeling in the oppression as Davakar whispers and beckons to them, they had to make a corruption check. They had to make a resolution check for temporary corruption, as it was their first experience with the dark forces of the Davakar. Even though that's just the edge of the bright Davakar, they need to know there's a potential danger. They all made their, uh, uh, made it easy. It was like a plus two to their, so they all made it. Nobody suffered uh, temporary corruption. And then, of course, they needed to make their uh, expedition rolls, and they failed miserably. They ended up, I ended up using from the starter set the, uh, uh, what's called the mishaps table. They roll, I had them roll the die, and it was, a, it was a field of thorns, which basically forces them to lose a day circumventing the field of thorns, or they can choose to go through it, risking damage. They chose to lose a day on their travels and uh, camp at the far end of that, and then start again the next day. So they lost the complete day in b being ultimately lost in their bushcraft check, right? Then they rolled again the next day to get on the right track. They con they exceeded, they, they, they um, succeeded in that. And because we're still using expedition, I have expedition results that I wrote for the module. They then roll a d20 at advantage if they've succeeded, and that will put them some, there'll be a random event that occurs in front of them, right? They can either make it to the main scene of the adventure, or they would be interrupted by these random events. A camp, a ruin, Queen's Rangers. So they ended up running into a small ruin. They decided not to excavate. They went back on the road. They then encountered the Queen's Rangers who went through their baggage, checked their papers, and gave them uh, some information about about uh, early summer. That was, uh, I was foreshadowing that there were going to be early summer elves at the particular final destination. It was a foreshadowing of things that might come. Uh, smart players aren't stupid. They know that's kind of a hint as to what's in this area, right? And then they make another expedition roll, and they actually at that point I decided you're only, or I didn't decide. They had already traveled half the day. Dell then did his fortune telling, and uh, yeah, the ritual was cut in half, and he could he asked the question, are there, are there, is the Iron Pact at the at the final destination? Yes, they are, and because I de defined that it was such a short. Normal. Normally, the ritual takes an hour. It, it, he traveled very quickly. It happened very quickly. He saw the elves at the ruin, and they knew the ruins uh, because they knew it was a giant pillar. And uh, of course, by describing that, I was shortening how much further they had to go to get there. So there was no more expedition rolls. We just then narrated how they stopped. They finally, after four hours, get to their final destination. Then we go to the main scene, which is called the pillar. And the pillar had then sub scenes. The sub scenes was chamber one uh, entrance. Chamber two, uh, uh, excuse me, entrance, then chamber two, which was the flight up, and then the final chamber, the top of the floor. So technically, the pillar had then three sub scenes or rooms: entrance room, second level, third level, and then there were things there they would have to face. Uh, but the pillar scene ultimately was about exploring the, around the pillar, de deciphering what was there, and of course there was a cannon ran hidden in the vines that was going to wait for them to camp, and then it would come down and assault the weakest. Uh, easiest to kill target. Well, they ultimately uh, uh, spooked it, right? They ultimately climbed into the vines and it attacked the barbarian. We had the Canaran fight. Uh, and then there were things that related to the Canaran that directed why there was a Mer an injured Mercat in the entrance with a dead elf. And then the other two elves were hiding in the floors above because they were all trapped in this pillar because there was a Canaran out there. And none of them, and the Meerkat wasn't going to face the Canaran. So they were all trapped there, and that became that became the short dungeon crawl. Uh, so we went up as opposed to down, right? And then we had the ruined entrance. That was the sub. That was sub. They got in there after the fight with the snake. Then we had the middle chamber. That's when they went up and were ambushed by the elves. They negotiated uh, for the elves to surrender, and then they ultimately coup de grace the elves. 
uh, the Iron Pact, who are who are their enemies, they discover at the top chamber that they had been camping there, that they had had they had all the loot from all of the expedition explorers they had murdered over the last how, however many uh, weeks or months. They discovered that they killed 24 treasure hunters over the last uh, few months, and uh, that ultimately they uh, they discovered the artifact, and then they headed back. Return to Rigol was the final interlude. We go back. And uh, Rigol pays them with the value of their artifacts, and uh, they negotiate a higher uh, a pay uh, based on Dell's ability to ultimately win any social challenge with the goblin at difficult or higher level. So he ultimately demands that he pay him more, and of course, Rigol complies, they get more money, and then they agree to sign a one year contract to be sponsored by Rigol. He pays all expenses, but he gets 35% of everything they find, and that's it. Uh, game over, session over. So that was my adventure. and. Uh, um, that that concludes what I had prepared, and then I just used this to remind me of where we were at, or what was uh, what was upcoming, uh, to prompt my memory as to what I prepared in the module. And then I can pull the module up in, on the on the PDF computer during the game. You'll see me reflecting on my glass. You'll see me looking up whether it's a cunning check or whether the snake is uh, you know in the pillar or whatever. So you know I had that. To, uh, all the details were still there in front of me, but I call that. Traditional gaming. That is traditional adventure night. That's Pathfinder. That's D and D. That is 99.9% .9 of what most gamers do. Right? They sit down with their party and they're trying to get, they're trying to uh, work their way through the campaign of of, of Castle. Uh, what, uh, what is it? Ravenloft. Right? And 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 along the way, there's going to be these campaign events that are ultimately adventures or modules that will slowly work them toward the castle itself and to facing the big boss by the end of the campaign. Whatever the case may be. There can be a lot of player agency in whether they choose to go right or left, etc., etc., etc. But the gist of it is most, most, most sessions have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have a predestination. The GM, in a way, has either put them on a path in which they're going to go through this thing, right, or they at least know certain truths, right? And so uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, right? I've been doing that most of my life. What's changed for me in the last couple of years, especially the last, I would say, the last four years, uh, having experienced more games as a player and slowly saying mm, some things I like some things I don't like as a player uh, Experiencing lots of different game systems that have liberated me or have reminded me of what I don't like about overly complicated crunchy games And then finally the last three years or two years developing this idea of true uh, naive narrator uh, and uh, uh, Player agency will right free will versus predestination so I'm now going to give an example of what I mean by that. And it, sound, it may sound like I'm saying that one kind of gaming is better than the other. It's not. It's just, it's, it's just the nature of what ultimately Dell and I style, which is, which is aided by our system and our game, Dark Age of Man. But this can be achieved, in my opinion, with any game system. Crunchy, simple, whatever, right? It's about, it's about recognizing that player, the, the will, the player free agency, the player, the will of the player is choices. You give, they have choices and their choices ultimately will lead, will, will have consequences and they will lead to results and that will lead to the next choice and the next consequences and the next results. Therefore, the next choice. Therefore, it's, 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 it is not a pre-designed, pre-end understanding of where we're going to go. That is what we're doing in Dark Age of Man. Now, why does our system, when we talk about system matters, why does Dark Age of Man make this easier to achieve as a GM? Because we ask the presenter to know only so much and present much of what the GM knows, the players know. So when I give them the setup, it's, they know what I know. When I give them the inciting incident, they know what I know. There are really two secrets, uh, three secrets in Dark Age of Man session, right? There is the major dilemma, which they must discover or will learn just through the nature of the world. The minor dilemma that can really affect the major dilemma, those things, they do not, they are not told to start the session, right? Those are the two things that I'm, in a way, aware of. I'm omniscient about, but that's it. And then the random C generator, which I only know it's a vague reference, and I don't even know what's going to come up. And I don't even, I'm not forced to roll more than a few. I could roll all, I could roll a lot of them, I could roll one of them, but I don't have any clue what's going to stir the pot, right? Now, why does this work? Because we have characters that are aware of the world around them and the, and the ultimate circumstances. They are then free to pursue their goals and their motivations. What happens when they do that? Well, they create conflict. 
If they avoid conflict, that creates conflict. If they embrace conflict, we have conflict. The results of those actions will further develop emergent narrative, emergent story, not pre-designed, not predisposed, not predestined. Next, I roll a random seed that may or may not be uh, triaged as more important than the current dilemma. Right now, they're dealing with a pagan Christian result, but let's say I roll dragon attacks Dredgewater, 18. When that dragon hits Dredgewater, all hands on deck. They will, they suddenly, everyone in Dredgewater is either fleeing for their lives or they're, or they're facing the, the utter uh, 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 conflict of a, of a major threat, a threat greater than their pagan Christian problem right now. Famine? What the hell? Starving's irrelevant if this dragon vaporizes me. So things are put into perspective via major variables and minor variables. And the players then are free to anticipate, or not anticipate, are free to react or give weight to those variables on any way they see fit, okay? And so therefore it creates their, they will take actions based on their own free will and their own decisions. That will lead to results which may or may not resolve some conflicts but create other conflicts. And therefore we have what is called naive play, naive narrator. Players are generally naive. We're naive, right? I have planned today. I've got chores I got to do. I'm, I'm going to have to get my car. I've got to go grocery shopping. i got to stop by and get some photocopies made. And I've got to go by and pick up uh, pills from the vet for my dog. Guess what? The car didn't start. Well, those three things that I had pre-designed pre uh, are, are now completely washed away as I have to get my car fixed. Damn. This is now problem one. I have no choice. I have a choice. I could let my car sit and do nothing and just watch TV, mow the lawn, or I could have it towed to the auto mechanic. So, have it towed to the mechanic, and from the mechanic I find out it's gonna cost me $1,200, what the shit? Dude, I don't have $1,200, now I have a couple of choices to make. How do I get that $1,200? Do I let the car go? Do I sell the car and, and buy a bicycle? Do I, uh, do I take out a loan, to, uh, you know, which means I'm gonna have to work more hours at my job, which changes my, my life, or do I rob a bank? Now we're talking about what are you doing in here talking to a lawyer because you made a decision to deal with this $1,200 car thing by robbing the 7-Eleven and you ended up in jail and now we're going to have a trial. That is life. And I think it is ultimately the style of gaming Dell and I have tried to perpetuate. It's the style of gaming that we're trying to uh, achieve and to, and to liberate GMs and players to have this. Uh, I agree, system matters and I agree that Dark Age of Man achieves helping a table to get there by by the nature of the setting providing class-based structure of the dark ages the uh, fantastic dilemmas the pseudo historical issues that occur allowing them to create a character uh, uh, with simple ratings that weight their character in the world put their character in the space then we go to work and I think I think the nature of the naive narrator and the random seed chart and this is where I think Dell and I may differ I think Dell still believes randomness is what's creating it. Uh, that's just a feature that keeps me from pre-deciding what would be a great thing to happen in a session. Uh, so I sit down on our next session and I go, man, I got a great idea for Psy. I'm going to hit Psy up with this problem and they're going to end up dealing with this problem the whole session. What a great idea I've got. And it's going to lead to a trial in which, in which he may be drawn and quartered. That's predestination. I am pre-deciding the challenge I'm going to put in front of Brian and, and Cy and the rest of the group, and it, I know that it's going to lead, I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I think it's probably going to lead to a, a trial in which he's going to be, he's going to be on trial for his life. That's what I call pre-deciding. Even though I haven't pre-written the, the, the module, I haven't pre-written it, I have technically decided that's the best thing to happen in session two. I have broken Dark Age of Man. I have refused to play Dark Age of Man appropriately. I am ignoring the system and the mechanics and the conceits of Dark Age of Man for a traditional GM, I have a great idea, let's see how this goes, night. And that's fine. There are plenty of brilliant DMs and GMs out there that do that, and they are really good, and they're able to create amazing sessions because they, they, they come up with these really cool dilemmas and, and players enjoy it. Nothing wrong with that. Our system, our mechanics say... You can't do that because you're going to roll this random variable and you you can't ignore it. You've got to somehow get it into play. And that keeps the GM from wanting to pre-decide what's going to have weight 
in today's session. I already know there's a major and minor dilemma. That's going to be existing whether they deal with it or not. And that's going to complicate their lives if they don't. But I'm only allowed to complicate their lives. I'm not allowed to make them deal with the major dilemma. It's just going to complicate their goals, their lives, their other problems. And that is free will. That is true, in my opinion, true player agency. That is what we're getting in the nature of our style and our rule book supports that. Do I believe you can do this with any game regardless of that? Yep, I think I've already answered that. I do. I believe we can do this with Symborum. I believe we can do this with D&D. It's, it's, it's a matter of how we present, how we t take the players and the value of the characters and we place them in the world fiction they all already understand and know and then they're faced with legitimate conflicts and tough choices. Risk, reward. Man, if I go A, I can't do B. And if I do A, it's going to lead to these things, maybe. But then that's going to lead to A and B. And that's going to lead to A and B. And we're going to we're gonna have... And meanwhile, because you ignored B, B comes back at some point to complicate your life or to complicate the world. I didn't deal with... The, I didn't tell the... I didn't prepare... I didn't tell the king to prepare for a Viking army. I, I just... I, somehow I didn't get that information to the king. I got sidetracked. I failed to give him that information. And now they're not prepared when the Viking army invades. The player is not responsible. The player lives with that on his conscience. Dang, I might have been able to help the king with this Viking siege if I had just told him the Vikings were five miles down the road preparing for a siege. So the player, there's a consequence there. That he has to live with the results of not telling the king, even if it didn't directly impact his life. Right? It's going to complicate his life. And then now the Vikings are ruling the territory and the Vikings are raiding, raping, pillaging, and plunging uh, from his old fortress that he used to live comfortably in with the Lord. Now he's living in the woods trying to avoid being killed by Vikings, right? So that's a living world, right? And, and again, it sounds like I'm lecturing. Uh, we've had a great conversation on Discord uh, about the session. I think, uh, again, uh, I purposely, and I told them beforehand, I was going to create probably a five-scene adventure. It was going to be basically we're going to do this as an icebreaker You're to learn the rules, to learn who your characters are, and to get everything started. And then I knew I wouldn't be GMing this as an, a, the second session. I knew I'd be handing that GM seat over to David so David can do Symborum any way he wants to and I'll be a character. Or Justin will reprise his character and Dell will reprise his character and we'll have an amazing second session with another GM. And I love that. I love the idea of rotating GMs or swapping roles. I love it. And I don't care whether we do pre-designed adventures. I don't care whether we have complete player agency. I don't want complete agency if a GM doesn't know how to handle our decisions. So I'm going to be honest with you. I think most GMs, experienced or inexperienced, don't allow complete agency because they don't know how to create conflict. They don't know how to take natural conflict and then ultimately it creates uh, uh, through character, action, and results the next phase of play. And I don't mean that I don't mean that to knock anybody. I mean it's hard. It's really difficult uh, to to prepare like that. So GMs will say, dude, you can't prepare for that. No, you can't. That's our point. We're trying to tell GMs, you're right, you don't prepare for it. Be naive. It occurs. Oh wow, never saw this coming. Never in a million years did I see Vidar. So I'll give you an example. Session one of our chronicles. If I had decided session one was going to be about them traveling out to the Pagan Stones and fighting the Pagans at the Pagan Stones, Vidar would have never, would have never accidentally run into the Vigilantes and he would have never uh, uh, nominated himself their leader and ran off leading the Vigilant Vigilantes. And therefore we wouldn't have had the encounter with Rolf and we wouldn't have set the tone that he is now known in Dredgewater as the guy who was given orders to the Vigilantes. Now, what does that mean? You say, well, okay, so what? What it means is if the vigilantes perform some act, some illegal act, or perform some horrific act, Dell's character is going to be tied to the vigilantes as their leader. As they ask witnesses, ask and uh, investigate, and people say, holy cow, you saw this ragtag group of guys hang the, the youngest son of the Lord? This is a major offense, and they're and those and they all say, well, yeah, it's it's these six guys, and they were all out with pitchforks, and uh, you know, Vidor was leading them last night. Now Vidor is a fugitive who may be responsible, or they think is responsible. So suddenly Vidor is facing false accusations because he took control of the vigilantes. Right? This occurs because Dell says, "I'm leading these vigilantes up the road." I didn't. I didn't predecide that he's going to be a vigilante leader, and he's going to ultimately face the consequences of their actions. 
but this could roll, this could be rolled up on my next random seed. I put down the random seeds in preparation, and I put on there at number 11, Vigilantes. Why at 11? It's pretty common. Right now, the Lord of Dredgewater has issued a decree that all of these criminals are dealt with, and therefore Vigilantes are, are running free. They're doing this by decree. So it's popular. This can happen every single day and every moment of every day and every moment of every night. The vigilantes perform some act of what they think is justice in the name of the Lord, uh, Washburn Lord, right? What are the odds? Vigilantes, right? I roll vigilantes. And then let's say on the next roll, I roll 18 and it is Connor uh, hung, right? The youngest son of the Lord Washburn is found hanged. I can combine vigilante with Connor and say, uh-oh. Now there's rumors about that the vigilantes uh, may have hung Connor, right? They, we still have to prove it. We still have to prove, number one, that's what happened. And then we have to prove Vidar. Vidar will ultimately have to prove he was part of it or not part of it. We don't know. And that is the thing. And it, is it complicated to do? I say no, because you don't have to know where all of these infinite things can go. That's the point. So if I say to somebody, give player agency, they go, dude, you can't because I can't come up with infinite things they could possibly do. You don't have to. You do not have to. You have to understand the setting. You have to understand their place in the world. You have to understand what's going on around them. You have to know the, uh, the monster stat blocks. You have to know whether there would be wolves in this area. You know, all those kind of things that a GM does when he does a hex crawl. Would there be wolves in the desert? And eh, I'm going to reroll that random wandering monster. You know, one of the complaints of wandering monsters is, what the hell is that creature doing in this dungeon? Doesn't matter. You're in a dungeon crawl. Roll with the baby, right? Mystery Science Theater. Sit back, relax, don't ask any questions. But there were a lot of guys like me who did, never used Wondering Monsters because I felt they were completely, ultimately out of context. And eventually I started saying, wait a second, I can make Wondering Monster charts that are within the context of where they're at. And then I began to make my own Wondering Monster tables. But, but originally it's was like, I, I'm not going to have this random monster show up that is no context at all. Right? Uh, and again, a lot of people love to play that way and there's nothing wrong with that. That's gaming. Uh, it's all gaming. All of this is gaming. It's the nature of what we're experience we're trying to create or trying to experience at the table, right? So anyway, and I so I, in my remarks this morning, I said, listen, I think Symborum is greater than a hex crawl. I think Symborum deserves. Uh, uh, I think Symborum to me is the core rule book, and it deserves to be treated on a more uh, uh, a deliberate level of play. That doesn't mean it has to be a module predestined. But I think it deserves more character focus, therefore less random hex crawl ex expedition and excavation adventures. I was least impressed last night when I made the expedition rolls and we made the random uh, expedition chart rolls. It just changed the nature of what I felt Symborum was. When I, when, I, when, I, when I ran Symborum in the past, I ran Symborum with ideas and goals, right? They were going to be these characters starting in a place and they were going to learn of a thing and then they would pursue that thing and they would rectify that thing and then the next session I would have their, their characters would be in a space, an interlude, and then they would learn of something else and they would they were trying to get, they were working from, I can't remember the town, Regina, Regina, whatever, right in the past. They were trying to get to Thistlehold. So their five sessions were all about their chronicle of adventures to get from the, the, the Titan Mountain, uh, the little town there right outside the Titan Mountains as you as you get into the north. They were having to traverse from there all the way up, and I think in one session they were they were working for a lord on a little manor in the in the in the plains, and they were repairing palisade fences, and they were doing these kind of mundane jobs to get Thaler so they could then pack up and travel to the next spot. And we had, in a way, a goal. They were going to go from here to Thistlehold. Then we would decide if we were going to keep playing, and they would adventure traditional treasure hunting outside of Thistlehold. But none of it was hex crawling, so to speak, right? They were traveling along the road or the rivers, and then they might, like Kung Fu, come into a little village and do some stuff to make some thalers in that little village, and then they would travel up the road and discover a, a, a camp of Ambrians that were dealing with an undead problem. They would stay there for a while, they'd deal with an undead problem, they would come back and they would get thalers, they'd get enough money to get their boat ready, and they'd go up the river a little further. So they, they, were, they were doing Kung Fu, going from town to town to town to town, dealing with a thing to get to Thistlehold, and we got five sessions done. They didn't. We weren't quite at Thistlehold when we when when we ended those sessions, but that was the gist of it. There was a thing to do in this town at this stop at this camp, as opposed to random directions, random adventures. So that was my first experience with Symborum, and and I loved it, and I loved the game. And we were in this dark place. They weren't even yet at the Davokar, right? This was just these young teenage boys trying to get. 
from there to Thistle Hold, right? So, and they were going to become treasure hunters. Their, their, their goal was to get there and, and, you know, go out there, you know, from zero to hero, so to speak. Okay. And last night I prepared a thing so they would have an icebreaker and they would learn the rules. They would experience some broom and then hopefully I would set an amb ambiance and an atmosphere where they kind of got the sense of the weight and the grittiness and the oppression without making it, you know, grotesque. Uh, and of course we were in the Davil car on a simple mission so it wasn't going to get too heavy and weighty as far as corruption. They weren't going to face any truly sick or corrupt creatures at that point yet. Right, so there you have it. And they would experience artifacts. If they found an artifact and wanted to try to bond with it, they would have the chance to experience those rules. They didn't. They refused to ex, uh, excavate the small ruins, so they didn't experience the excavation rules. They didn't experience the artifact bonding rules. So there were rules that they chose, player agency, they chose, we're not going to dig this up right now. We're going to come back to this. We're not going to take, we're not going to bond to this arm man. We're going to take it back to the man that technically owns this, that we owe this to. Uh, so that's brilliant, and I, I thought it went great. I had a wonderful time. I don't care if something's prepared, as long as the players feel they have agency, as long as the players feel they're free to still do the thing. They had a mission: get from here to the pillar, investigate the pillar, and then come back with treasure to resolve some of their problems. One, they needed a uh, they needed a sponsor. They needed the money to buy their own stuff. They needed a money. They needed money to have a really agency. They had enough. At the end of the session, they had 521 thalers. That's enough Thalers for them to have complete agency for session two. They could have then said, we're going to Thistlehold, we're going to pay the fee, we're going to rent a home, and we're going to, we're going to go buy our thing, we're going to stock up, and we're going to start adventuring for ourselves. They would have had complete agency with that amount of money to then figure out how they want to go about their future. They chose to sign a contract, which is still going to be free, it's all going to be paid for, but they're going to be operating illegally, basically, in Blackmore, out of Thistle Skull, Scold, not really dealing with the authorities. They're not really going to be paying their taxes. They're not really, again, this adventure license that they have that was paid for by Rigel, they don't even know if this thing is uh, forged, right? None of them actually said, can I investigate this paperwork? Is this stuff forged? None of them made that role. Uh, the Queen's Rangers, I was going to ask them to make a cunning versus cunning check against the Queen's Rangers that the Ranger might discover that this thing was uh, forged, and they would have all been caught with forged uh, explorer's papers. But then I realized that we would probably then never get to the pillar where I wanted them to experience combat with the snake, etc. Et so I, I, I chose, again, GM Fiat, not to have the papers forgeries, right? So therefore, they're operating in Blackmore under the radar, but they've got a sponsor who pays all their bills. All they have to do is risk their lives to make more treasure and deal with their own personal motivations. And this could be a great chronicle. This could go on to be a nice little campaign, simple little fun jaw jaw campaigns in which their characters develop and deal with some problems. We could do that. Uh, so, uh, and there's no shame in having modules. There's no shame in using campaigns and using modules. There's no shame in knowing that they're, the players are ultimately, hopefully, in a group with a goal to achieve a thing. Uh, we don't want to play meaningless either, right? Dell and I have this conversation many times. You never want Dark Age of Man or any game using our style to just end up in meaningless kind of pointless circling. And there's a real danger with naive play that you will find yourself, if it's not in uh, context, if it's not made contextually relevant, which is why I tell people when you roll that random seed, you must place it in the context. If not, it becomes just a random variable that sidetracks the session, the game, the characters, the motivations, and they never actually have closure. They never actually achieve any sense of growth with their repute. So the thing you must be careful of with our style of naive narrator is everything must be contextual and the players have free will based on their, their situations and their motivations to deal with these contextual problems. The vigilantes and a dead Connor. I can make, I can use the vigilantes contextually as what's actually just happening in the world, or I can tie them to another random seed that now further complicates and makes dangerous the world for not only Lord Washburn, who decreed these guys go out and, and uh, take justice into their own hands, he's responsible for his youngest son's death if that comes up. What mourning and what problem do we have now that Washburn's distraught and he's angry and he wants revenge? Those things I don't know before session because I haven't rolled Connors found hanged, right? I roll Connors found hang. I know, oh shit, the fallout from this, this is world changing. And guess who was leading the vigilantes three nights ago? One of our main player characters. We have an amazing session come out of the results of them finding the youngest son 
hanged. And now we've got a major problem. I mean, this is like a, this is worse than a dragon hitting Dredgewater because the fallout from Lord Washburn's anger and mourning would be phenomenal, coupled with the pagan Christian derangement he has going on. We know these things. So when something rolls up, I put it in context. In context with the pagan Christian derangement of Lord Washburn, his son, his youngest son's found dead. What are the odds he's going to blame the pagans for it? And he is going to have an all-out war on every pagan in every nook, cranny, and hovel in Dredgewater. We have got a fascinating turn of events, right? And that's really the difference, I think. But you have to be careful that it doesn't become kind of meaningless, random, point-to-point -point gaming where there's really no closure. The players never succeed in anything. They might get repute for doing some action, but they're not really achieving any stature in the world. Uh, our first session was 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 brilliant. Uh, we've seen Psy, uh actually uh, the weight of Psy in the world and what he's created in his in his navigating this very precarious place of of his right versus what he the, the Lord might think is right. Lord Washburn. I don't mean the Lord God, but Lord Washburn. And then of course we've got we've got Vidar, who's kind of coming out of mourning. Vidar's first session was kind of like trying hopeless flailing, trying to find some reason for it all and he's in a way found that in the authoritarian authoritarian actions in a way of Psy taking matters into his own hands doing helping the, the poor the innocent you know Vidor's character in a way defines himself as hey I trusted in God this passive kind of God will take care of it well like most Christians I think in, in, in truth discover you have to help yourself right there is no, there is no sit around and wait and God's going to provide it, right? I don't believe in that, right? And, I, and I'm thinking that Vidar, in a way, was convinced of that by Falcone. And now he's finding out, wait a minute, uh, you know, uh, maybe action is the way to salvation. Psy, his actions are actually commendable. And there may be some salvation found in acting, right? Vidor has only taken control of a rabble of vigilantes. He hasn't yet figured out, what can I do with this vigilante group that's really... Uh, commendable, right? We don't know. I have no idea what Vidor is going to go. And, and is he even going to be with the vigilantes ever again, right? And then we have Ethelwold, who's the most, he's the one faced with the most serious responsibilities. He was sent from London to convert pagans. He has to answer to Lady and Lord Washburn. And of course, he has, uh, he has a troublemaker peer in Falcone. Ethelwold right now is the most, he's the one that quite literally has a job to perform and he has responsibilities that have made far more troublesome because he, he, he performed a miracle, which means he's going to be inundated with people thinking he's a miracle worker. So Sam's character is, 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 is fascinating to see how Sam deals and still pursues his motivations and goals, but has to deal with this kind of weight that he's now a freaking prophet to many of these people, right? And I think it's fascinating because the weight of him, even in the eyes of Lady Esmeralda now, where, what is it, does Lady Esmeralda believe he performed a miracle? We don't know, hasn't talked to her yet. Does Lord Washburn believe in the stories that he performed a miracle? If they don't, they shrug and say, as long as the people are okay with it, what do we care? But if he does, what does Washburn and Lady Esmeralda think of Ethelwold if he indeed, if they believe that he performed a miracle of God? Right, Ethelwold suddenly becomes what? A very important person in Dredgewater, right? So these are the amazing things that came out of one two-hour session. This session literally went two hours and I think 14 minutes and we talked for another 30 minutes or so. In two hours, uh, I cannot believe everything that we learned about the characters, the world, the conflicts, the situations. Uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been, it's remarkable. Last night, we learned a little bit about the characters. We learned clearly that Vikomir is connected to his, his wolf. We learned who Malius is, and we're beginning to see, you know, what these characters are. We're learning who Shig is and what Shig's about. And Shig appears to be uh, one way, but then when dealing with his goblin uh, sponsor, could turn on this kind of serious authority. You know, what is that, what is that really? What does that tell us about Shig, right? That what we perceive as, in a way... Uh, raw and uncultured and unsophisticated we find out though somewhere in shig there's a level of iq there's a level of genius and a level of social understanding that none of us saw coming when he said i i, I want more failures you son of a you know and he got him right and so i think that tells us something about shig i don't know where dell will take shig but those are fascinating observations right 
And we haven't even begun with the Simborn characters to know. But they have money now, they have a contract now, and we're beginning to find out some of their background and their personal uh, uh, legend, which is going to ultimately then uh, create opportunity for conflict, right? If we were playing a campaign. Now, again, we're going to rotate GMs. We'll see where this goes. But I, uh, personally, like I said before, um, uh, I could play this uh, uh, as a player or as a GM, um, uh, basically, and uh, uh, for... for for swear uh, or for whatever the term is, uh, and uh, and um, uh, be content to play Symborum in multiple ways, whether it's uh, pre-written or whether it's hex crawling. I, I don't think Symborum, and I know there will people tell me, dude, I, that's, I, when I got those rules for the hex crawling and Symborum expeditions and excavations, dude, we do these amazing hex crawls, and that's all we do is we treasure hunt. I'm happy for you. I think Symborum is is could be it's weightier than that. I think you can have more serious character driven things in Symborum than just uh, old school hex crawling. So not to say you won't have great fun doing that again. So I'm not, I'm not telling you what's fun and what isn't fun. I'm not telling you what's good or what's bad, what's better, what's worse. I'm just defining, and I'm trying to make clear that what makes Stark Age of Man different is not randomness, right? But it's certainly not predestined play. So thank you very much. Everybody have a fantastic Sunday. And uh, I don't know when we're playing next. I don't know if I'm playing Tuesday night in Joth. I don't know if we're running something else. I don't know when I'll next run in Symborum. I don't know. Well, I know that I'll be running in uh, early September Symborum for my local group. So I'll recap that or once that session's in the books. Uh, and Dark Age of Man, I think we're going to try, again, we're going to try to do once a month. So sometime in September, we're going to queue up uh, the second Chronicle for Brian, Sam, and Dell, and we'll continue Dark Age of Man. Outside of that, I won't have a whole lot to say on the channel until there's more gaming going on. Thank you, and I want to thank David, um, Justin, and Dell for a great session last night. I enjoyed the hell out of it. It felt a little cumbersome for me at first because I was reading directly from a module uh, that I wrote, but I hate reading when I play. I like everything to be spontaneous and I like everything to be described kind of how I'm feeling at the moment but I wanted to make sure I didn't forget certain key details of Rigel the goblin uh, this goblin sponsor and I wanted them to get the sense of the tent city of Blackmore and what they were kind of dealing with in the introduction outside of that uh, then it got kind of back to normal gaming with some meta conversation etc etc and I, I had a great time combat was a tiny bit uh, uh, there was there were two moments in combat that were a little bit cumbersome, and that was when uh, the mare cat was introduced, escaping the tunnel. We had to then find the mare cat's place on the initiative list, which meant a couple of dice rolls because there were so many ties. We had three, I think we had three or four characters tied with both quickness and vigilance, which meant we had to roll a d20 to break those ties. That kind of gummed up the thing. And the irony is, it was just escaping. I could have made GM Fiat there and said, this thing just races out of the tunnel and off into the woods. It's not, it's not getting into combat. But then, but then there's a couple of things there. One, um, it takes the mystery out of what's happening and what's coming. And second, it keeps the players from engaging in it if they wanted to kill the thing, if they wanted to actually face it. It would have taken, it, it would have taken again, their agency to embrace the Meerkat as a, as a combatant. So I, I wasn't going to GM Fiat it just right out of play. But the reality is it was escaping. Once the snake was tied up, it took a chance to go. And uh, once the, once this thing heard the skirmishing and knew the snake was scared, whatever whatever a cat is thinking, the cat was getting the hell out of there with an arrow in its back, right? Uh, and it was indeed wounded. Uh, so if they had fought it, it was already at half its toughness. They would have dispatched that cat pretty quick. So it wasn't as dangerous. It was dangerous if it bit them and poisoned them, but outside of that, they would have dispatched that cat in one or two shots, probably. The snake proved to be great fun because it's so cunning and it has great armor, uh, but it's actually fairly incompetent in its attack. So it was kind of fun how the snake would try to entangle something, and because it's it it but it's so dangerous. Once it entangles you, it is very difficult to escape, and it makes the snake such a great uh, again. We talk about system matters. The nature, when you think, oh, how is the snake dangerous when it's a plus five attack? It's it's horrible attack. Right. The snake is not necessarily going to cause wounds on you every turn. But, dude, once it grabs hold of somebody and it's strangling them, it's also using them as a shield. I could have activated through acrobatics that the snake would 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 use this, do uh, this wolf as a shield. And I could have taken some defense or I could have taken some damage. I could have distributed some damage from David's sword attacks onto this wolf, right? So it's a very, very cool 
technical thing. And again, I wanted to use the snake because I thought it fit Symborum's little setting so well. It set a certain tone for the kind of world it is, especially in the woods, right? I'm thinking more of a, a, a Howard-esque, right? I'm thinking more of Conan-esque, right? With the serpent and the pillar. Um, in a way, uh, Symborum to me is kind of like a dark, gritty Conan, right? Uh, I just love Symborum setting and I love its uh, classes. I'm uh, not classes, it's races. And again, you can pretty much sculpt the character any way you want to, which is also a joy, but they're not overpowered and they're never going to bloat up, right? There's not enough experience or time for them to actually get way too fat, and way too bloated. There's so much to love about Symborum. So much to love about Symborum. So anyway, I can't wait for David to run us. Um, it, it's going to be great fun. D David is never, uh, for us, not run a great game, whatever it was, whether it was Vance Fighting Fantasy, uh, gosh, what else? There was something else David ran for us. It was fantastic. So, I'm looking forward to it and playing a character in my favorite uh, modern fantasy game. All right, thanks. Bye-bye.